we're now we're now in public session as we have a quorum I call the meeting to order um, colleagues at the outset once again can I remind you if you have phones could you either switch them off or to the flight mode please uh, they interrupt not just the meeting but the recording and broadcast as well in accordance with the standard procedures agreed by the committee on procedure and privileges for paperless committees all documentation for today's meeting has been circulated to members on the document database I propose that we go to private session to deal with correspondence and other matters is that agreed in public session I wish to draw your attention to the fact that by virtue of section 17.2L of the Defamation Act, witnesses are protected by absolute privilege in respect of their evidence to this committee. However, if you're directed by the committee to cease giving evidence in relation to a particular matter and you continue to so do, you're entitled thereafter only to qualified privilege in respect of your evidence. You're directed that only evidence connected with the subject matter of these proceedings is to be given, and you're asked to respect the parliamentary practice to the effect that, where possible, you should not criticise nor make charges against any person, persons or entity by name, or in such a way as to make him, her or it identifiable. Minister, your opening statement has been submitted to the committee and to be published on the committee website after the meeting. And members are reminded of the long-standing practice to the effect that they should not comment on, criticise or make charges against a person outside the House or an official, either by name or in such a way as to make him or her identifiable. Minister, I'd like to welcome you to the committee this morning. Thank you very much uh, for your attendance and uh, your submission, which has been circulated to the members. At the outset, you'll be aware this committee uh, has a short life. Uh, it was set up at the end of April and due to report within a couple of weeks' time. Um, and it's appropriate that we would engage with you because the issue that we're addressing needs a cooperative and a collaborative approach. So we're hoping that you know, the recommendations that will come forward from here will be evidence-based and uh, that they will be recommendations that you will be able to give uh, impetus and implementation to. Uh, we look forward to your presentation and afterwards colleagues will have a number of questions, but thank you for your attendance. Thank you, Chair. And uh, can I say, I just, I'd like to read a, uh, um, an introductory statement into the record, um, but I'd, um, I'd like to take questions then and maybe focus on some of the areas that the, that the committee wants to focus in on. My statement actually is pretty general. Uh, uh, and so, uh, uh, from my perspective, <clears throat> in terms of the interaction with this committee, uh, I'd like to listen uh, as much as, uh, as I contribute, but obviously any questions you have in terms of our thinking or our approach to date, uh, I'll be as upfront and as, uh, as open as I can be. I've already met some of you directly um, from different political parties to try and explain the approach we're taking uh, towards housing, uh, which I regard as, as, as a national emergency, particularly uh, in some of our bigger urban centres. Um, and uh, we can go in to some detail if you want later on uh, in terms of um, our thinking to date uh, and the timing of when we will launch uh, a formal response to that in the, in the context of the Action Plan for Housing, which will be launched later on in the summer. Um, uh, first of all, can I just thank the committee for inviting me here today uh, to address you, and uh, I look forward to the discussion. I want to introduce the department's uh, officials who are accompanying me, uh, Barbara, uh, Barbara Nick Angus, uh, who's uh, Assistant Secretary, Maria Graham, Assistant Secretary, uh, Niall Cusson, uh, a Principal Planning Advisor, Barry Quinlan, uh, a Principal Officer, and um, Brian Kennedy, uh, uh, who, uh, uh, sorry, Brian Kenny, uh, uh, who has a specific focus in relation to homelessness uh, uh, and, um, uh, 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 and is here also with us. Um, firstly, uh, I'd like to commend the committee on its work to date. Uh, in a very short space of time, the committee has consulted with a vast number of key stakeholders and experts in the areas of housing and homelessness, and I look forward to the committee's report in due course. Housing is an absolute priority for this government, uh, and I was appointed as Minister with specific responsibility for housing, planning and local government to focus intensively uh, on the challenge uh, of tackling the housing crisis. I have recently been joined by Minister of State for Housing and Urban Renewal, Damien English, uh, and we have been tasked with preparing an action plan for housing within the Government's first 100 days, uh, working with our Government colleagues and key stakeholders. Importantly, the action plan will build uh, on the work already carried out uh, or underway and will draw on the important work carried out by this Committee. 
the plan will include actions to expedite and boost supply of all types of housing, including and in particular social housing, uh, in the immediate, medium uh, and long term, uh, 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 with a, a long term view. Uh, while it's important to boost housing supply for everyone, the action plan will focus in particular on those feeling most difficulty in accessing housing and rental market markets at the moment. Minister English and I have initiated some early intensive engagements with people who have been working in the housing and homeless areas for many years to discuss the broad approach on the Housing Action Plan and to develop a common understanding of the housing situation at present. I am firmly of the view that the, that the position uh, can only be described as an emergency, uh, particularly uh, in our key urban centres uh, in Dublin and Cork. It is impossible uh, not to be uh, really affected by the experiences of families and children in long-term emergency accommodation. Uh, and uh, I can tell you my resolve is very strong uh, in terms of finding a way to impact positively and quickly uh, on the plight of many families uh, that are currently in totally inappropriate accommodation. Uh, uh, and that needs to change, uh, but we need an infrastructure change uh, and an approach change to make that happen. Uh, today presents an excellent and timely opportunity for an informed discussion on the diagnosis of the key challenges, particularly in housing supply, and the actions required to be taken urgently. In terms of my approach, I want to prepare a plan that the members of the Oireachtas and key housing stakeholders can subscribe to. Uh, I absolutely believe that if we work together uh, uh, in a way uh, that, that uh, uh, can tackle uh, the emergency conditions, um, we can and will turn around uh, the situation, uh, focusing uh, on actions we can take in the short and medium term. You won't find me overly party political on this issue. I can promise you that. Uh, if people have sensible suggestions, we'll listen uh, and we'll try to respond. We're not going to agree on everything, uh, so let's not pretend we are. Uh, but I do think we can agree on a lot that can actually move the process forward. And so we will take the recommendations that come from this committee very seriously. Uh, we'll assess them. All the decisions we take will be outcome focused. Um, uh, and my only interest here is to try and get a property market and a housing market moving, uh, to try and make sure that we have a very ambitious um, social housing program uh, uh, that we can deliver, uh, and to, uh, to look at the multitude of sectors and areas that are impacting negatively on the housing um, market at the moment uh, with a view to trying to uh, bring about better outcomes. Um, uh, housing lasts for generations and takes a long time to put in place, which is why our current difficulties go back uh, to how construction and, house uh, and the house building sectors uh, collapsed during the downturn and have really struggled to recover since. Uh, the way the residential sector operated uh, with the banking and lending sectors in the past <coughs> led to much of our problems, uh, and we can't go back there. Once the economy collects, uh, collapsed, uh, Ireland simply stopped building houses private and social housing, uh, uh, for the best part of the last 10 years, apart from finishing out some schemes uh, and uh, obviously a number of uh, one-off houses that have continued. This lack of supply of housing in the right locations is a critical factor underpinning the current crisis. Just over 12,600 housing units were completed last year, almost half of which were individual one-off houses, and many of the, the rest of that number were actually finishing off unfinished housing estates. Um, we need to, to be building somewhere in the region of 25,000 housing units per annum to meet the need, uh, and we need to ensure that these are in the right locations and are the right type uh, to meet our evolving uh, household formation and demographic, demographic patterns. In fact, my view is we need to go well beyond 25,000 houses for a period of time if we can. Um, so, you know, a country with Ireland's population, I think it's accepted by most needs to be building about 25,000 housing units a year of the right size and in the right location, as we say. Uh, but because of the dramatic deficit of the last decade, uh, in my view, we need to go well beyond 25,000 if we can get there. And we need to sustain that uh, for a five to 10 year period to actually deal with the deficit of the last 10 years uh, before we create a more normalized um, uh, housing market again. Furthermore, many of the, uh, the active sites uh, in the Dublin area uh, are delivering housing at prices uh, which are not affordable for the majority of first-time buyers. In simple terms, 
about 40% of people who are in the market for a mortgage uh, to buy a house uh, cannot get uh, finance for a house that's priced at over 300,000. There isn't a single house being built in Dublin for less than 300,000. So, so, so we have 40% of the house buyer market essentially with no houses being built for them. Uh, and that is just one of many structural problems in the housing market that needs to be corrected. And it's not easy to correct it given the cost of building a house uh, and in particular the, uh, the financial arrangements that many developers and builders will have in terms of cost of sites and so on. But maybe that's something we can talk about later on. Um, if ordinary people are spending more and more of their income on rents and mortgages, that leaves less uh, for many other demands of life. And this is affecting uh, the real economy, but most importantly, people's quality of life. Uh, it also puts many working families in a more perilous financial position uh, and for some, a uh, risk of homelessness. <coughs> if we allow the current supply trends to continue and don't take some key decisions quickly, uh, in my view, it could take another 10 years for the market to right itself uh, and for supply um, uh, to meet our needs. Such a scenario uh, and the related impact on people's real incomes and lives is socially and economically unacceptable. Uh, and that's why this is such a priority for government. Put simply, the housing situation is affecting every sector of Irish society uh, and putting at risk our hard-won gains in terms of employment, uh, recovery of competitiveness and the attractiveness of Ireland as a place to work and live. Even in, in the context of bringing in foreign direct investment from abroad, housing now is becoming one of the real barriers uh, to, um, to companies wanting to come and employ here uh, and bring new workforces here uh, in, in terms of uh, their ability to be able to access uh, affordable, high-quality housing. <coughs> in terms of solutions, it's important to recognise uh, that we're not starting from scratch. Uh, I am on the record uh, uh, of acknowledging uh, the work of my predecessor, uh, Alan Kelly, uh, particularly in the area of social housing and homelessness, and I'm happy to do so again today. Um, uh, a lot has been done, particularly uh, in, in putting in place a 3.8 billion euro housing, uh, social housing strategy, uh, the actions on homelessness, rent certainty uh, and uh, private housing viability. Uh, but there's a lot more to do, in truth. Uh, just to recap uh, on some of the key actions already taken. Uh, part 5 has been reformed to make uh, delivery of, of social housing possible uh, and uh, wider developments viable. Uh, development contributions have been retrospectively lowered and a rebate scheme for housing uh, at more affordable prices uh, in Dublin and Cork has been put in place. Uh, a vacant site levy has been introduced, although it obviously there is a delay in terms of that taking effect. And we can talk about that later in terms of why that's necessary from a, le uh, from a legal perspective. Um, new rent measures were put in place, apartment guidelines were uh, reissued. Again, I think there's some confusion about that, uh, and again, uh, it would be helpful to maybe clarify uh, why we've made decisions uh, in that area later on. Uh, NAMA has outlined uh, its programme to fund the development of 20,000 new homes uh, and a half a billion euro uh, uh, active capital NTMA development finance package was also put in place. Um, I, I put these measures on the record to outline and recognise the building blocks that have been put in place, uh, but the government recognises that further actions are required to increase housing construction uh, to create a, a functioning housing market. Many think that a, a, a total focus on public housing programmes will solve the situation. And while I agree uh, we do need to, to do a lot more uh, on the social housing side and quickly, I don't think anyone uh, really believes that only social housing needs to be built. Uh, we need to have a mix and a dramatic increase uh, uh, in the number uh, of, of houses that are being built uh, and supplied, um, both in social and in the private sector. We must also focus uh, on other parts of, of housing, including doing all we can to keep people in their homes. Um, uh, they have uh, and ensuring that the rental uh, and private housing construction markets function properly and deal with the backlog of a decade of undersupply so that people don't get squeezed into homelessness uh, and social housing waiting lists um, uh, when they can be accommodated uh, through the housing market or the, the private housing market. The government knows uh, we have to get housing right, and it's for that reason that I per personally sought this portfolio, 
I, I am working very closely with Cabinet colleagues under a special Cabinet committee uh, chaired by uh, the Taoiseach that meets weekly. We have already met twice and we are meeting again this afternoon. Um, um, so it is every week effectively so far since the Government has sat and that is going to continue until we have a, um, a, a, the right um, action plan for housing in place. Um, uh, what we have focused on so far uh, uh, is how to uh, more quickly tackle the issue of those living in emergency accommodation by expanding uh, and uh, expediting solutions. Uh, the programme of rapid delivery housing provision is being implemented to mitigate the acute issues associated with homelessness. Um, it is my ambition to accelerate and expand the rapid uh, delivery programme significantly. Uh, uh, we are also looking at accelerating the delivery of uh, uh, the social housing strategy. Under the social housing strategy 2020, targets have been set for each local authority out to 2017. Importantly, local authorities and approved housing bodies have a strong pipeline of construction, uh, turnkey and acquisition projects, which will deliver some 3,900 homes, uh, with approved budget cost uh, of some 680 million. Again, it is my ambition that the delivery of these homes will be accelerated and that the, tar and that the targets will be exceeded. Uh, increasing the overall output uh, of private housing uh, uh, separately, increasing the overall output of private housing to meet the 25,000 which is acknowledged uh, as the likely uh, annual uh, supply need. Um, in the programme for government, the ambition is to get to 25,000 housing units by 2020. Uh, obviously, our job is to try and get there a lot sooner than that. Um, we are also looking at, uh, 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 to achieve this, um, uh, we are examining further potential barriers uh, in terms of service land, funding and financing uh, and uh, delivery mechanisms. We are also looking at ensuring uh, that most of the additional houses and apartments are affordable and meet the needs of uh, all sectors of society, whether that is students, older persons uh, and an increasing uh, portion of one to two person households. I mean, one of the most of you who work in, in terms of trying to access social housing for, for, your, um, for your constituents will know that people who run housing lists on their own or as a couple uh, really face huge disadvantage uh, uh, versus others um, because there simply uh, isn't the sufficient housing stock with one or two bedroom um, accommoda uh, accommodation. Uh, and, and again, most of the you know, three bedroom MEDs is, is about um, uh, responding to the needs of families, which leaves a lot of people literally on housing lists for, for years without really any um, realistic aspiration of getting, getting the result that they need. Um, uh, we are obviously also looking to replace the boom-bust cycle of construction and housing supply through better management of land supply and development process. Um, to do this, uh, I am preparing a delivery and supply-focused housing action plan. Importantly, the plan is being developed with colleagues uh, 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 on the Cabinet Committee and will draw on the report of this committee, uh, which I understand uh, should be ready by mid-June, I, I hope. Um, I know when my predecessor attended this committee, uh, he said that he favoured a Minister for Housing, but only with a broader range of powers in the areas of finance, expenditure, social protection, etc. Uh, the Cabinet Committee includes my colleagues, uh, the Ministers for Finance, Public Expenditure and Social Protection, and is chaired by uh, Antishik. So the plan uh, is being jointly informed and developed uh, through the weekly Cabinet Committee uh, and senior um, officials group that's linked uh, to that Cabinet subcommittee. So essentially, <coughs> rather than giving a single Cabinet Minister all of the powers, uh, there is um, essentially a contribution coming from multiple departments and multiple Ministers. And time will tell whether that works, uh, in truth, um, uh, whether or not we get the buy-in uh, we need from, from other uh, ministers and other ministries, but so far there, is, um, uh, there has been an appetite right across government uh, to, to ensure that, that we do something substantial in terms of uh, the response needed to, um, to the housing crisis. Uh, in terms of uh, the immediate supply boost that is needed, uh, the absolute focus uh, of the initial actions in the plan will be to boost supply. And I have asked local authorities and NAMA for concrete proposals to boost supply in the short term on land they control or influence for all types of housing, both social housing uh, and housing for the wider private market. So, in essence, what we have done is we have asked local authorities to come back with an emergency action plan. 
Uh, we'll have those plans, I hope, by the end of this week. If it goes into next week, it's not the end of the world, but we're putting uh, local authorities under some pressure to, to come back with uh, an ambitious approach towards what they can do locally in the areas and land banks that they control, working with um, the developers that they can partner with, working with NAMA if they're partnering with NAMA, uh, working within SDZs if that's what they're doing, uh, or within the various other frameworks that they operate. Uh, and we will publish those plans as part of the, the overall action plan for housing so that people can see what local authorities have come to the table with. Uh, and I think that's important. Uh, we will then help, obviously, those local authorities uh, deliver uh, on the potential of those plans and that will involve contributions from me and from my department and from other departments in government I'm sure in terms of freeing up uh, and removing barriers and streamlining processes and providing finance uh, and other other vehicles some of which we, we might be able to talk about later on. Um, the Taoiseach and I met with uh, local authority chief executives on the 12th of May uh, in order to discuss, among other things, uh, the housing situation and in particular boosting supply and the future delivery and implementation of the targets set for the local authorities under the social housing strategy. Uh, the meeting provided an opportunity for a very useful exchange of views and I reaffirmed the government's um, uh, 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 my own uh, and my department's commitment to supporting local authorities' efforts to deliver on the ambitious targets they've been set. Acknowledging the efforts that have been made uh, by local authorities, working in conjunction with approved housing bodies uh, to deliver on, on the social housing strategy since its publication in November 2014. I outlined my ambition that the delivery of homes under each of the social housing programmes sh should be accelerated. Uh, in that regard, I've asked all local authority chief executives for their ideas and proposals to expedite delivery of social housing, which is what I've just referred to, and we're getting responses back now. Uh, generally, uh, in making proposals, I've asked both NAMA and local authorities to consider how best to work with builders uh, and the construction sector. <coughs> for its part, uh, the government has committed to making funding available for social housing and for infrastructure to facilitate the development of all types of housing. We're also committed to examining all aspects of the viability equation, particularly uh, input costs, uh, to help ensure that housing is uh, intrinsically affordable uh, to bring on stream, uh, whether for buyers or providers. We're looking at all aspects uh, of the house delivery process, from land availability to financing, planning and procurement, uh, to ensure that an appropriate balance is struck in increasing supply uh, on the one hand, but avoiding another property boom on the other. Uh, I want to see proper planning, not just uh, building houses, uh, but creating places that people uh, will be proud to call their homes. I want to see strategic thinking uh, and action, uh, infrastructure and amenities going in before or uh, as places uh, are developed. Uh, we do need to learn lessons uh, from our recent property and debt fueled economic crash. Given the gravity of the situation, uh, we are uh, happy to think radically uh, and are prepared to do whatever it takes to mend the housing system in Ireland, obviously within certain parameters. Um, once the government takes action, uh, it will be very important that, that the delivery agents and the construction sector respond, and I will seek assurances uh, that if we deliver, they will too. And what I mean on, by, in a practical sense on that is if we are going to do something on taxation, or if we are going to do something in terms of streamlining planning systems, um, that you know, if we are going to move and change processes to make things happen, we expect the private sector to respond accordingly. Um, and without that assurance, we're not going to do it, quite frankly. Um, uh, um, we are hard at work uh, on drafting the action plan at the moment, and my approach is to consult broadly. I've met a large number of key stakeholders already, uh, and my door is always open to anyone with good suggestions on how to boost supply. The action plan will be published over the summer, within the first 100 days of this government, and its implementation will already uh, uh, have begun at that stage. I mean, just in terms of um, uh, one of the problems around the 100-day target is that actually it lands right in the middle of August. Right? So, for obvious reasons, that poses a problem because most people, aren't, a lot of people, aren't focused on work in the middle of August. I suspect. Some of the people at this table will be, but, um, but a lot of other people aren't. So I think in reality we will end up publishing 
our, our, our plan at the end of August and moving into September with a really proactive and aggressive work program to actually implement it and, uh, and ensure that it works. I think that's the likely timing for it at this stage, which essentially is launching it just immediately after the 100 days uh, and, and then selling it. We could launch it at the end of July and then have everybody heading off on holidays and I just don't think that's, that's the kind of momentum that we want this, um, this project to generate. Um, uh, the report of this committee will form a key input, I think, uh, and I would um, encourage people, obviously, to, uh, um, to um, not only to contribute to, to a report that can be useful for us, but also to follow that up then with meetings with me or with our key officials here, um, so that we can get under the skin of some of the recommendations that you're making. Um, some of them we may not be able to take on board, I don't know, I haven't seen all the recommendations yet, um, but, but we will, as I say, my only objective here is to get better outcomes in terms of house delivery, in terms of responding to, um, uh, to people's dire need for state assistance, uh, whether they be homeless at the moment or whether they be at risk of homelessness or whether they be on a social housing list relying on the state to deliver for them. Um, I can go into all sorts of reasons why we are where we are today in terms of a dramatic deficit of supply and housing and all of the pressures that that's putting on people. Uh, but to be honest, my focus is really on where we're going from here uh, and what um, contribution I can make along with a great team of people in my new department uh, to actually um, get a dramatic change of circumstances around the housing market as quickly as we can. Uh, and that's what we will be listening to you on, uh, trying to take on board um, um, the ideas that we feel can work uh, and uh, engaging with you in as transparent and open a way um, to do that as possible. So, thanks, Chair. Th thank you very much, Minister, for your opening statement. And just before I go to colleagues uh, to say, from the committee's point of view, we're very pleased to hear that the recommendations that will come from this committee will be dealt with in a meaningful way. That you know, The committee has put a lot of work into meeting 40-odd different witnesses uh, who have uh, a lot of expertise in different areas. And I would hope that the recommendations that come from the committee will be evidence-based recommendations, practical, meaningful, evidence-based recommendations that you'll be able to work with. And that's the context in which this committee has been doing its work. Uh, the first colleague who has indicated that they have questions for you is Deputy O'Brien. Thanks, Chair, and, and thanks, um, Simon, for the, the presentation. Um, first of all, like John, I just would like to welcome the fact that you're giving a commitment to work on a, on a cross-party and independent basis. Uh, and I think that's really important, uh, and I do welcome it. What I would say, however, is the, the proof is going to be in the content of the action plan, and certainly for, for our party, the, the two key things will be the extent to which that plan uh, uh, departs from what we're clearly of the view uh, is the failures of government policy up until this point. That's my fault, sorry. Um, and also uh, the actions that it takes to increase the supply in particular uh, of social housing. One of the difficulties I have just with the presentation is that it still seems that there is a lack of full understanding as to uh, the crisis at the social housing end of the sector. Many of the organisations that have come to us, particularly those who are representing people at risk of or in homelessness, uh, for those people, those are people who the market isn't going to provide solutions for. It's that social housing sector broadly defined that's key. So for example, when we look at your comments on the diagnosis, uh, it's not just the collapse of the property market uh, at the start of the recession. For over a decade and a half before that, the state was withdrawing from uh, a serious provision of social housing. And the reason why we can say that is because during all of that period from the early to mid-90s, the level of people in housing need, whether they were claiming rent supplement uh, uh, or, or other social supports, was dramatically increasing, as were social housing waiting lists. So even when the state was building more houses than it ever done before, the level of housing need as defined uh, by your own department's measures and others uh, was increasing. I'm also concerned that you are still overly reliant on the private sector and low level of investment as per Social Housing 2020. 3.8 billion over six years isn't a significant level uh, of uh, direct government investment. And even if it leverages in uh, uh, outside investment, uh, it still is relatively low uh, in historical terms. 
uh, and it can't be said enough, 80% of the units, uh, as envisaged under that plan, are private sector owned units subsidised by the state. So they are market units, not social units, however we define them. Uh, and again, I think until we see a departure from that over-reliance on the private sector, we're going to have the same problem. My questions, I suppose, and, and I'll make them very brief, uh, and there is much, I suppose, things for you to consider uh, in the run-up to developing the plan, is we are strongly arguing in our party that you need to significantly increase the supply of social housing, but also to broaden the definition of who is covered under social housing. So not just differential rent social housing, but cost rental and affordable purchase for lower income families. Uh, and if you move in that direction, uh, and directly provided by the state, I think you'd have a much better uh, impact on the crisis and stabilisation of the housing uh, system. We also need to increase and change the model of funding social housing and crucially tackle procurement. I'm, I'm, I'm a little surprised that you keep talking about planning as the key problem in the, the delay. And I'm not saying there aren't problems in the planning system, but actually the greatest delay in the provision of public housing and social housing is the lengthy approval and procurement process between your own department, uh, uh, deeper uh, and the local authorities and unless that is shrunk down we're going to have the same problems. The third issue is, is the issue that the housing agency continually talks about is managing the existing stock. They've given us a report, 230,000 vacant units. We know that's 2011 figures. We know when the census comes out, it will show a significantly reduced number of vacant units around the state. That's not contested. But it'll still be, you know, possibly even half. So rather than just an exclusive focus on supply of private housing, better managing that vacant stock and investing in that is a much quicker route to providing those units, whether for the social or private sector. Likewise, tackling issues around mortgage distress and rents, and I know some of those aren't your department, but I think for you to take a strong stand on those issues, particularly the likes of rent certainty, uh, could help. And the last point is this, um, we had a very powerful presentation from Sunnis Housing around the links between domestic violence and homelessness. Yesterday, a, a number of members of the committee uh, again attended a very powerful presentation by about 20 individuals and families who are currently in uh, homelessness folk, uh, facility by Focus Ireland. In, in trying to tackle the broad range of issues that you've outlined, we also need to ensure that that uh, cohort of people who are in homeless services, some of them in homeless services for very long periods of time for reasons such as domestic violence, mortgage arrears, rent uh, uh, costs, uh, etc., that we properly fund those services and ensure that those services meet the needs of the people. And, and the one thing I would advise you to do is uh, go and meet the people that we met uh, yesterday. I'm sure Focus Ireland will facilitate it, because what they will tell you about their experience of homeless services is very, very different from, I think, what many people who don't deal with homeless services think. Uh, and I think listening to those people prior to doing your action plan would be very helpful. But the key message from our party is, Unless the stock of social housing is increasing through purchase refurbishment and new build, we're not going to tackle the most acute end of housing need. And that's not to say that we don't need private sector solutions elsewhere in the housing market, but that, because it's your responsibility as, as Minister for Housing and Public Housing, should be your primary focus in our view. Thanks, Thank you, Deputy Minister. In your reply, Deputy O'Brien referred to the procurement and the relationship between your department and local authorities. And while you might want to comment on it, we will deal with that in more technical detail when we have the local authorities and the staff from your department this afternoon. So you needn't go into that. You can, you can refer to it, but it, it will be dealt with in some detail this afternoon. Yeah. And you, the other, you, you may respond, respond, please. Yeah. yeah. No, um, to be honest, I, I don't disagree. I mean, Unusual for a Fine Gael minister responding to a, Fine Gael, to a Sinn Féin questioner. I don't disagree with, with a lot, actually, of what, of what uh, Deputy Brin has been saying. Um, we do need to increase significantly the provision of social housing. Uh, and that has started and is happening. Uh, I mean, if you look at, uh, there's 5,000 units brought back into to use over the last two years uh, in terms of vacant social housing units. Uh, last year, I think it was about 2,700 in terms of what some people regard as voids that, uh, that, were, that were brought back into use. Uh, the percentage of, of voids now in social housing in Dublin, I think, is down to about 1%. Um, so there's been a big effort in, in, in that area. There's been significant improvements in Cork and Galway as well in that, in that issue. This year, we're expecting about another 1,500 to come back into use. Um, but, I mean, undoubtedly, uh, the reliance on the private sector alone to, to solve a, a social housing need uh, through, you know, 
you know, supported rent schemes uh, 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 or through, um, through other um, uh, supports um, you know, has resulted in, in core social housing stock numbers falling. Uh, and that is a, um, that is a problem. Uh, and, uh, and it's something that we want to address. So, so the, the core numbers of social housing available to local authorities and to approved housing bodies needs to increase, uh, and we want to work with them to do that. Um, but I do think the private sector has a big role to play in making that happen, because what we don't want to do, in, uh, uh, and I'd, again, uh, I'd be very interested in your report on this, what we don't want to do is to have a massive social housing build programme that isn't building integrated our accommodation for integrated communities. So, I mean, the kind of social housing provision that I would like to see us deliver is integrated within private developments, within affordable developments, um, so that we have uh, you know, integrated mixed communities as opposed to having social housing in one part of a city and solely private uh, uh, or predominantly private in other parts of towns and cities. Um, so uh, we do need to see a significant increase in the numbers of publicly owned uh, social housing stock, appropriately managed, um, uh, and that is starting to happen. Uh, but I, I, I also want to see that integrated uh, within, uh, within private sector developments as well. Um, and I think we are starting to see um, um, uh, very proactive planning um, uh, with that in mind. Obviously there will be some direct build social housing estates uh, or there will be um, approved housing bodies who will be purchasing turnkey solutions of you know, groupings of 30 or 40 or 50 houses um, that, um, that can be very usefully used. Uh, but what I'm talking about is not Re repeating the mistakes uh, potentially uh, uh, that were made decades ago where we had huge swathes of, uh, of, of urban um, uh, uh, centres that were solely social housing. Uh, and I think that would be a big mistake. But it, to be fair, I'm not sure anyone's asking for that. So I don't want to, don't want to suggest that you are. Um, in terms of um, uh, uh, delays around uh, procurement and approvals, uh, we have worked within this, uh, the department to try and shorten the length of time that it takes to get approval. So uh, a year ago, there was what, an eight or nine stage approval process? Nine stage, nine stage uh, um, approval process. It's now a four stage approval process. Uh, and so one of the things we'll be doing with local authorities is um, uh, trying to um, shorten the time frame from when a project is being designed and muted to when it gets uh, to when it gets approved, and that will mean us sending, you know, delivery teams to local authorities uh, with with architects, quantity surveyors, engineers, designers, and so on, so we can sign off on designs earlier, rather than having a sort of a back and forth, um, you know, email uh, contact uh, around uh, a, a agreeing on costings, uh, designing. A, 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 designs, density, and all the other things that are linked to, um, to some of the social housing projects th um, that we're doing. So we have, <coughs> we have um, three and a half thousand social houses at uh, stage one approval at the moment. Uh, we need to get all of those projects through to stage four as quickly as we can, so we can get on and build them. Um, and um, uh, the, the, um, the, uh, um, our department uh, officials and uh, CCMA uh, will be here this afternoon to provide more detail on how those processes will actually work. But essentially the way I view it is that this should, we should be taking a project management approach towards these individual projects uh, with local authorities. Uh, and, uh, and as I say, we will send teams of people down so that over a two or three day period we can iron out a lot of problems that may have taken months perhaps in, in the past uh, in terms of a back and forth communication, um, trying to get sign off or agreement on design or costings or whatever. Um, <coughs> the, um, so I, I think the point you make, just because I haven't raised it in my initial statements, isn't, isn't to suggest that we're not focusing on it. Um, on the procurement side, um, one of the things I think we could do more of is actually having central uh, uh, agreed, approved lists of contractors that local authorities can actually use. So, so for example, on the, on the rapid build uh, projects, uh, we will have by midsummer 
uh, the Office of Government Procurement will have an approved list of contractors that local authorities can simply uh, access and take uh, a contractor from the approved list rather than having to go through a three or four month procurement process within their local authority. Um, my understanding is that some of the larger local authorities already have approved lists uh, in place. Uh, so in, in Cork County Council, for example, and in some of the Dublin councils, they already have a, approved lists that allow them to be able to make decisions a lot uh, uh, more quickly than you might think in terms of procurement. And again, we want to see them using, uh, using that to make sure that we don't have uh, unnecessary delays uh, around the uh, procurement process. Um, in terms of vacant housing, yeah, I mean, I've, I've met the housing agency. They're very strong on the, uh, uh, on the potential of, of the opportunity, if you like, for the state to actually acquire large numbers of unoccupied vacant houses. Um, I've asked them to do a detailed piece of work for me on where are they, who owns them, how can we access them, um, uh, under what process, how could we finance that, um, can we do it off balance sheet, um, and so on. Uh, and so we are looking at the potential there. I think the figure of uh, 230,000, which is the 2011 figure, is, is high, as you say. Um, uh, we'll have a, a more accurate figure towards the end of June, I think, from the CSO in terms of the latest um, census. Uh, and, uh, but look, even if it's half that figure, it's still over 100,000 vacant properties. Uh, and there has to be a decent portion of those that are in areas uh, that we could, um, uh, uh, you know, that we could use in terms of uh, a potential for social housing. Um, so obviously, if we can buy property through acquisition that isn't being used at the moment, it's a lot quicker than building, uh, and we should be we should be using that opportunity. But again, we have to. Uh, look at what this might cost and how we might be able to finance it uh, in the context of, uh, of, of what's possible uh, at budget time in terms of the famous fiscal space and so on. Um, the, the other thing that, um, that, um, that is delaying a lot of projects, I mean, just, just to give you a sense of, what, of the opportunity here, there's enough planning permission in Dublin for 27,000 houses today. Uh, there's enough zoned land around Dublin for 88,000 houses today. Uh, about half of that requires some intervention in terms of infrastructure, but most of it is localised and not you know, very high cost infrastructure. Um, so, um, and the, there are 4,400 housing units on building sites under construction at the moment in Dublin. So 4,400 of the 27,000 with full planning permission of the 88,000 in terms of zoned land. Um, um, so there is significant potential here to dramatically ramp up housing provision in and around Dublin um, with the right interventions uh, around planning, around infrastructure uh, 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 and around uh, creating viability in terms of developers to make things happen. Uh, and that's, that's, what we're, that's what we're focusing on. And, you know, we could give you similar numbers for other cities, but I mean, Dublin is where the big numbers are. Uh, and, um, uh, and clearly there's a, there's a need to, um, uh, to try and release the potential of that zone land and, uh, and the planning permissions that are currently in place, whether it's through NAMA or whether it's through private developments, whether it's through social housing, uh, whether it's through local authorities, uh, or in reality, um, a combination of all of them. Um, just on the domestic violence and, uh, and homelessness um, 